Welcome back to boot camp. Uh, I can I, I I can guess that there are more than a few of you who have said, please, please, not another video filled with very small numbers. Well, unfortunately, yes, another video filled with very small numbers, but I've got an idea. Uh, the idea that I've got is to tell you what those numbers mean when you see them. In fact, you really don't even have to go look at all the numbers if you don't want to, because I will explain the process that I'm going to be walking through here uh, in this video. And some of you may have uh, heard the uh, presentation as a podcast. Uh, this this will be a little different, but uh, but generally the same information. But here's the setup. This this particular segment is 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 what I consider to be a discussion of one of the greatest luxuries, uh, financial luxuries that a person could have in retirement. And that is when you have more than enough. You have more than you need. Maybe you have 50% more. Maybe you have 100% more. Maybe you have 1,000% more. You know, what, what would we guess that Warren Buffett has than he needs? Well, it's a lot. I have no idea what that number is, but it's a big number. And that gives you um, a, a wider range of decisions of what you can do with your life whether it has to do with travel or charities or children or or it may be some people just like to have a great big pile of money that they can they can check on daily to see uh, to see if anything has happened they should be worried about well of course we're about trying not to worry and to figure out how when we get to retirement we do the best job of figuring out the distribution that we take. And that's an interesting decision to make because it's always about how much do you save for the future? I'm 80. Should I be worried about five years, 10 years? I'm certainly not worried about 25. But the reality is I have to make some sort of a of a decision about how long this money might need to last before. And of course, my, my wife's a little bit younger than I, about four years. And so that, that means I've got to make sure that it take, we take her into consideration. But it is a whole series of what are, are big decisions, but they aren't, they aren't all that hard to make. But here is where we come to a fork in the road. A lot of people save enough. Think of the person who is saving to retire at age 40, uh, part of the FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early. Now, they are retiring early, as soon as they can. And they've got a number. And that number is often, uh, and that number being how much they need, uh, is the number that if you take 4% of it it, 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 it is what you need to live on. And the fact that you need it to live on probably means that as inflation makes the cost of living higher, that you need the portfolio to go higher with that inflation. Doesn't mean you need a lot of growth, but you need some growth. And so that's an interesting decision. And in fact, that person may be promising, I am never going to work for money again. This million dollars is going to cover the cost of living. And only if I'm backed in a corner will I ever go back to work. I am going to work my tail off in the world, but I'm going to do it for free, whatever it is I'm going to do. So that's a huge decision to retire with a million dollars and take out 4% and increase it every year. Things have got to go your way. A five-year bear market could be really uh, hard on your portfolio, particularly if it's a bear market that 
that takes a substantial amount of the value of your portfolio each year. So there's a certain amount of luck that has to go uh, with that uh, 4% distribution strategy. So that is what we then use the fixed distribution tables for. We talked at length last week about that. But now we have the person who's coming to retirement. And they have consciously waited to retire until they have some multiple of the amount of money they need. I did that. I didn't want to retire with enough. I wanted to retire with more than enough. So one, it would allow me peace of mind because I've always had the fear of running out of money before I run out of life. So if I have way more than I really need, I should have better peace of mind. Uh, and I do, by the way, it's made a big difference. I, from, from how I would have, I think, thought about it if I had just saved enough. It also allows uh, spending and giving a lot more. Again, depending on what the multiple is of what you need versus what you can take. And in this case, with the flexible distribution, it is about not really just thinking in terms of what you need. It's about how much you want to take. And in fact, if you're taking a lot, uh, then inflation is not a problem. Because to the extent that I had a bad period or two, the market wasn't doing what I wanted it to, I could adjust and go back to living more like I'm living on enough rather than have living on more than enough. There, there are choices. So just imagine a portfolio that instead of, in, of, of retiring with a million, you retired with two million. But what if your cost, your real need cost of living was still 40,000? It's just that you have more money to support that $40,000 need. But if 4% is a, is, is a good number that would allow you to more than meet your needs, then it would seem to me I could consider taking 4% of 2 million instead of 1 million. I would only have a need for, for 40,000, but I would take out 80. And I could give away, I could travel more, I could whatever I wanted to do with that extra money. And to the, stack that the, to the extent that I actually couldn't have needed that money, uh, I, I could adjust. If I had some unusual kind of catastrophic short-term challenge. I mean, it doesn't make it, you're not completely... Uh, free from some risk in life, but most of the risk is gone. And it's gone significantly or sufficiently enough that in staking, instead of taking out 4%, why not take 5 Maybe, maybe if you got enough, why not take 6 Well, maybe we got to look at the numbers. I can tell you, if you don't want to look at the numbers, that you will be amazed at the impact of having oversaved and what your portfolio might grow to over time. And then, and then not only is it a matter of whether you decide to take four or five or six, what happens when you use a different underlying portfolio? Maybe, for example, a portfolio that is something more than the S&P 500, like we've talked about the one that, that, that is a half and half, half in small cap value, half in the S&P 500. Is that more risky? Well, there have been periods it was more risky. But if you have oversaved, not only may it be reasonable to take out more, but it's also maybe more reasonable to have the equity portion of your portfolio 
be a little bit more aggressive. Now, I'm talking about a little bit. I am not recommending cryptocurrency or owning individual tech stocks to build your portfolio. I'm still talking broadly diversified. I'm still talking indexes. I'm still talking low expenses, low turnover, massive diversification, all of those things that I think are in your best interest, whether you have a hundred thousand or a million or two or three or four million. But you could have a different group of underlying equity assets when you have oversaved. So there are a lot of possibilities. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get set up here so that I can share my screen with you. And for those who are thinking of joining me and looking at the numbers, I am going to recommend that you ever either have a very large screen or that you print out. They'll, there's a PDF where you can just print out uh, all of these uh, uh, tables that I'll be referring to. And as always, I'll be encouraging questions. Uh, and this is one I think I might get a few on. And, uh, and we'll try to answer them in the comments section here on the video on YouTube. Or maybe we'll use it uh, right on the page uh, that we'll have devoted to flexible distributions on our website. Uh, we're going to have a lot of Q&As there that will build over time that will apply just to the flexible distribution strategy. So thanks for being here. Now, let me get set up and we'll get to work. Okay, we're all set up and ready to go. Flexible distributions, 2024 update. This is something we do every year to, uh, to, to communicate with the folks that are following us, to, to add all the new numbers because we've got a, number, a, a new year to be able to add. And uh, I have got my pages in my hand so I can see these numbers. Uh, but here we go. Table D1.4. I want to start here. We showed this last week. This is the fixed distribution. This is the one where you start with a million dollars and you take out $40,000 a year. And every year you increase that by the amount of the consumer price index so that you can see in this column that says distribution, here's 40,000, the second year is 42,000, then 43, et cetera, until you get all the way down here to the bottom of that page. And it looks like it is $314,000. And that is what $40,000, what it took to replicate what you could in theory buy uh, in 1970. So the million dollars is being asked to support that cash flow. And by the way, at the bottom of that page right now, that number is about $8.8 .8 million in total. You put in a million. We asked it to pay you out 8.8. .8. And what you see at the bottom, if you lived long enough to, to get there, is you have, for example, in the 100% equity, this is the S&P 500, you have 10.7, 10.8 million if you were 60-40. And I'm going to talk about 60-40 a lot today. Uh, you would have ended with about 9.3 million. So whether you had 60-40 or you had all equities, it's fascinating that the return... Uh, and the amount of money that you took out and the return on the investments themselves were about the same. Why? Because the 60-40 gave you some defense when the market was down. And so when the market came back, you had more money than the person who was in the all equity portfolio. So you didn't have to make as much on the upside uh, to make up for the terrible downside. And I want to point out, for those of you who weren't here, that in 1974, the 100% equity portfolio got down to a little over 700,000. The 60-40, you will see here, uh, got down to about 900,000. So it was still painful. 
But by the end of, of that 10-year period, you had more money in the 60-40 than you did in the 100% equity. All right. This is the 40%, the $40,000, 4% start. And this, and this, I think, is a shocker. If all you did was to take out 50000 remember, this is out of a million. So another 10000 doesn't sound all that threatening. But if you took another 10000 and then you started taking the incremental increases because of inflation over about less than 30 years, you're broke. Now, I realize you're not going to sit there and just go broke. You're going to change your lifestyle, probably. Maybe that lifestyle means you move in with your, with your children and, and whatever it takes for you to survive. But the reality is that one decision was huge. By the, by the way, if you only lived for 10 years, if, if you're not in good health, then it, it would not probably be considered threatening if you were taking out 5%. You could even take out more maybe at that point. But my the point I want to make here, which is so important, is that you can go broke thinking you're not making that big change. We also uh, showed what would have happened if instead of using the S&P 500, you had used the two fund strategy, half small cap and half S&P 500. Now, that means it's more risky. Where would you see that risk? You would see that during the difficult times. And right here, when, when the market was down so much in the 70s, you would have been down and even more. But when it came back, in fact, it came back by the end of even the first decade, while the, the equities uh, ended up at a million five compared to the S&P 500 at a little bit under a million. You had a distinct advantage, but you did have to go through a period where it would be testing your belief. That's just the way this process works. And that's why we think, you know, the 60-40, the 60-40, you still would have been down, but not as disastrously. And at the end, you have about 1.5 million. But by the time you get out 20 years, you will see that instead of 2.2 million here for the S&P 500, it's 5.6. You're on a roll and you're on a roll that keeps up to the bottom of, of the table. I don't mean you were the best every year, but at the end of the whole period of time, you have, uh, what, 154 million here under the two fund strategy versus about 12 million in the S&P 500 itself. Now, just so you understand, that's about a one and a half percent difference in return. I mean, this this, this is a combination of of the S and P five hundred getting uh, having a very difficult time to stay in the race, if you will, uh, during the two thousand through two thousand nine, what they call the lost decade. It wasn't a total loss for the two fund strategy. That made a big difference. And, and, and I'm not saying the S&P 500 is a bad decision. I'm just saying that if you have the risk tolerance and the trust, that adding a little, a, a little extra firepower uh, is, is, could be very important in terms of returns. Anyway, let's... Uh, oh, and here's, here's the uh, 50,000... With the two fund strategy, ah, okay. This particular table now is, I want to take you right to the, and I just want to check something here for a second. Okay, this is the $50,000 uh, distribution with the, with the fixed distribution with the two fund strategy. And the point I guess I want to make here is notice that while some of the columns run out of uh, of return, uh, that most of the columns make it to the bottom. Now, of course, at 80, I'm not worried about 54 years. But if I happen to live 20 years, I notice that uh, 
taking out the 50,000, uh, left it doing just fine and even makes it through 30 years uh, in, uh, in, in most, almost all uh, the cases. So what happens when we move to the flexible distribution? Well, we weren't at risk. Remember, we didn't, we didn't really uh, hurt ourselves when we took out 4%. So we would expect that as we move to F1.4 here, let me go to my One more sec. All right. F1.4, flexible distribution, 4% distribution. When I say flexible, it means you take out 4% at the first of the year. Every year does not go up by inflation. It could go up if your portfolio value goes up. That could happen. Now, remember, in the back of my mind, as I look at these numbers, I'm going to multiply everything by two. In other words, this is that million dollar decision. Okay, we started with a million, but I'm going to pretend that I had two million, but I only needed the $40,000 to live on. And so I've got way more than I need. If I take 4% out, I'll actually be taking $80,000 out. When I get to the bottom, for example, of the, this is 60, 40 right here. If I get to the bottom of the 60-40 strategy, I'll actually have twice the 13.9 million in year-end balance, and I'll, I will have taken out twice the $12.6 million in distributions if I had $2 million. If I had $3 million, I'd multiply those numbers by three. So that's kind of up to you how much more you, you, you're going to accumulate before you decide I'm ready to roll and start taking distributions. So there's your, the 4% strategy works well as a flexible, it works well as a fixed, and in, in neither case are you going to put great pressure, at least based on history, on the portfolio. Uh, and by the way, remember, the other possibility is a 5% distribution, and we can see that in the next table. The next table, F1.5, flexible distributions, moderate 5% a year distribution. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Margie? Um, we were just talking about F1. <laughs> Let me finish off F15. That was the S and P 500. Okay. Did I talk about it being the two fund strategy? If I did talk about it being the two fund strategy, I want you to come on and tell me that I did. Okay, I did not. Then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to F14. I'm sorry, F15, and it's still going to be the S&P 500, okay? All right, here we go. Now let's take a look at F1.5. This, I think, is probably the most remarkable of all the tables to look at. Because by going from a fixed to a variable or flexible, it shows that even if you were working with the million dollar distribution, which before you ran out of money because it could not take the, 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 the large distributions that happened when the market went down. But when you take the flexible distribution, here is what you're doing that's so magic. And it's, I mean, it just, it, it still blows my mind that it has such an impact on a person's financial future. If when the market goes down, you take a cut and pay, then if you can do that, however you can do that, if it's because you have 2 million instead of 1 million, and so you're not at risk of not having enough, 
or if it's because you simply know how to pull in your horns and live on less when, when you're not getting what you need. But I want you to look at that 60-40. As I look at the 60-40, I start out, I take 50,000. And then the next year, I take a little more because, because the portfolio ended the previous year up $33,000 approximately. And each year that it goes up, I get to take more. In fact, by, by 1973, I'm taking 59000 And then the terrible 73-74 period takes me all the way down, all the way down to $43,000 distribution before it turns around. But the, the impact it had in lowering the distributions when times were bad is it wasn't sucking more money out of the portfolio. So not only do you have fixed income there as a defensive strategy, you have your willingness to be able to cut expenses and live on less. Again, if you've oversaved and you needed $50,000 to start with and you had a million and a half instead of a million, well, now you got 75,000. If you had 2 million, now you got 100,000 if you're taking out the 50 and getting down to the 52,000 or the 43,000 is not is not going to kill you cuz you got twice that cuz you got 2 million. And then you keep going, and the market comes back. Now, I should say, and the market did come back. It doesn't have to come back ever, but because we can't guarantee that it will, of course. But history has it certainly has taught us that it does. So that by the time you would, remember when you ran out of money at the end of 30 years before? When you had the fixed increasing the amount that you were going to be paying out? Well, you've got, it looks to me like here, you've got um, about $6.7 million year-end balance. You're not broke. And you've paid out uh, that year, 312000 You're not broke. And You've had total distributions of 3.5 million so far. And all of this stuff that goes on for the last 24 years, that wasn't there for people who had made the decision to live on a fixed distribution and adjust for inflation and take out 5%. But for the person who was able to adjust themselves personally, takes discipline, it takes a belief that you're going to do better in the future. So you get down to the end of this 54 years, and that's legitimate for a 40-year-old person who retires early. They could live with this portfolio, the S&P 500 for the equity, 60-40 for the distribution, and flexible distribution. So... Let's look here at the next table. This one is 6%. Now you're really testing the portfolio. And you can see it holds up, doesn't run out of money after 20 years, as it did before, makes it to the bottom of the page, not with a lot of money. But let's remember that down there at the bottom of the page, you got over $9 million in distributions. And at the bottom of the page, you're still left with about $4.5 million. So that's not bad. That's a, a livable, I think, kind of a combination for people who, certainly for people who have oversaved. Taking out 6%, if you got two or three times what you need, uh, it should not uh, be, be, be a high-risk decision. All right.
Now I want to move to the two fund strategy. The um, flexible using the S&P 500 small cap value. And we want to see, and, and it's easiest, by the way, to see how it's doing compared to the S&P 500. If we just look at the all equity portfolio, because there's the S&P 500 and there is the two fund strategy. At the end of the first um, um, five years, 10 years, excuse me, you've got uh, almost uh, $600,000 more uh, in the two fund strategy. By the end of the 20th year, you've got uh, about a little bit, about 2.5 million or so more. At the end of 30 years, you've got um, about, let's see, let me, I got to go to my fine print here. You got 20, you've got about 50% more. You got 20 million here, almost 21 million here, and you've got almost 14 million uh, here. So it was a decided advantage. By the time you get to the bottom, it is kind of a, uh, it's a huge difference. It's 60 million for the two fund strategy and it's 27 million for the S&P 500. Uh, and this, by the way, assumes all these distributions. Uh, as a matter of fact, and we're going to, we're going to do an article in the coming months and a podcast uh, and a video on what if you were all equities your whole life uh, and to see what the implications of that may be. Uh, this is what you started. This shows you started with a million dollars. What if you started with three or four million dollars? Certainly a possibility for a lot of young people today and stayed all equity your entire uh, entire life. It's, it becomes a really big number, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, particularly if you started with more than a million at retirement as a 40-year-old. And there are people... There are lots of doctors, by the way, who are doing that. It's it's, uh, it's fascinating. If you're not a subscriber, free subscriber to White Coat Investor, and uh, and and uh, they're one of our truth tellers. Uh, th there are a lot of people who make a lot of money, and they make a lot of money for enough years that they finally move on and do something else with their life. Uh, that I have found to, that was a big surprise to me when I found out. That's what was going on inside the medical profession. Not every doctor wants to retire at 40 or 45, but a lot of them do. Okay. As we go to 5% with the two fund strategy, uh, we remember that it made it to the bottom, but it did not make it to the bottom with the kind of money that well, even going out 30 years, here's 8.7 million with the six, um, uh, the 60% uh, equity, 40% bonds. And then uh, here, let's go out 40 years. You're at, uh, let's see, I'll, you, uh, let's see. Hang on. You're at about 8.8 .8 million uh, uh, out to the uh, end of 40 years with the 60-40. I mean, the, the point is this, and I probably don't need to beat it this hard. Well, I can beat it one more here, I think. I can show you taking out 6% with the two fund strategy. And and, and, and and there you can take a look and, and see how much would you have had left with the two fund strategy uh, without multiplying some number over this million. In other words, if you didn't save 2 million, how would it have worked out if you just did it with a million? Well, to begin with, notice you had to be willing to go down to $46,000 as your source of income uh, in 1975. But then by the end of, uh, of the uh, third decade here, you were taking out 365000 You had taken out uh, $4.6 million dollars. Uh, and you had uh, $6.3 million still left in your investment account. So using, if you're willing to, to adjust your life 
not to inflation, but to the amount of money you got coming in. Maybe that means you go back to work to make a a, a bit to make up for what you really needed to have. I don't know how you'd solve the problem, but the flexible distribution strategy is just another legitimate way to access your investments for retirement. And the choices will be, do you want to take out four? Do you want to take out five? Do you want to take out six? Do you want your investments to be the S&P 500? I'm talking equity. Do you want the fixed income to be 60%, 50%, 70%? All those decisions, two fund strategy, the uh, four fund US, the, the return is a little higher with the two fund strategy. You can go look at the at the um, sound investing portfolios H two A to uh, to compare the returns and the risk of all of, of all of those different strategies. So, I know a lot of numbers, a certain amount of confusion, simply because there's so many numbers, and I apologize for that, but. The bottom line is send me the questions if you've got questions. Uh, we're going to do Chris and Daryl and I will be back together probably as a group in early part of May. And we're going to do a Q&A that we hit some of these on distributions, some on fine tuning, some on the portfolio, some on best in class, some on two funds for life. Uh, we're we're going to take a lot of questions. In fact, we may have two or three weeks in a row that, that we get caught up on, uh, on Q and A's at that time. So I, I, I hope that helps comments, uh, and questions, uh, in the, in the, uh, comment section of the video works for me, but you can also email me, Paul at paulmerriman.com. And, um, I hope that helps. I I'm anxious to hear what questions you have. Uh, and and uh, uh, and we'll, we'll we'll again we'll try to get answer everybody that we can. Remember, I cannot give a personal advice. I can only I can nudge, uh, but uh, but it can't be specific advice. So, um, good luck to you, and and um, we'll see you next week. Actually, next week you, I think you're going to see Chris Pedersen. I know right now he is working. Uh, on a uh, uh, one on, I think, two funds for life and an update on the best in class uh, ETFs. Those will be two different presentations. Uh, I will not be taking those weeks off. I have uh, presentations I'm giving myself uh, at Western Washington University uh, uh, in April. Uh, I'll be doing uh, the a series of three, four uh, presentations along either on my own or one with uh, uh, Christine Benz, uh, one with uh, Stan, the man, the annuity man. Uh, I'll be doing another one that will be uh, for the Bainbridge uh, Senior Center. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to like that one. Uh, it's all about how to make more money on your investments in retirement. Uh, and... Uh, uh, so we're we're doing a, a lot of work trying to reach as many people as we can. Anything that you can do to help us reach more uh, is is appreciated. I know I do have right at the uh, end of April, uh, uh, one of the physicians who attended the White Coat Investor Conference uh, that I spoke at uh, last last year. Uh, uh, she has gathered together a bunch of uh, physicians and I think others uh, in their hospital. And and uh, I'm going to be speaking to that group. I am always happy to uh, speak to groups of people, uh, whether they are, are people who work, let's say, uh, uh, for a corporation and they want somebody to uh, address the 401k uh, to the people who work in that group. And Sometimes we actually have can get a hold of a lot of people that way. I'm, I'm happy to do it for university classes uh, where I can work on Zoom 
And uh, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to help in any way that I can and glad to hear from you. Uh, please, you can reach me, Paul, at paulmerriman.com. Please include your phone number uh, if it's if it's a if it's a complex question. So if I have questions of you, I can just quickly ask them and not have to get into a series of uh, of emails back and forth. So thanks, as always. It's good to work for you, and I hope that uh, the work is helping.